les doy record así empezamos bueno no, no, estamos ya está perfecto perfecto pero sí no honestamente uh, quiero comprarme Call of Duty y este creo que va a ser uno de los I, I like it's one of the many games that I've bought this year una de las cosas que cambió este año creo que descubrí otra vez cómo jugar y, y encontrar tiempo para jugar y eh, darle tiempo a ciertos hábitos que tenía de, de pequeño que me daban mucha felicidad como eran jugar los videojuegos y cuando I sucked I still love playing video games claro. y durante mucho rato era como wow no I, I first need to make time for work then for fitness then for reading then for resting you know and then if I get any time I'll game and then you don't get more time y no sé al final del día este año me di cuenta como que en los, estos momentos que estamos en cuarentena y estás todo el tiempo en casa, también es importante darte un tiempo para ti mismo. Sí, hacer algo que te divierta. Hacer sí, algo que te y, divierta es muy importante. Y, y tú fuiste ese, esa persona que me, que me dijo, dude, agarra y empieza a jugar, ¿no? Y de verdad que le encontré otra vez mucho gusto a jugar. Y aparte de descargarme, you know, two or three games on Steam y después empezar a jugar otra vez en la Play. I, I started playing like Rocket League and I racked so many hours. Then I started playing um, on VR games. También, o sea, tuve que comprar muchos videojuegos de, de VR and I've been playing it. Digo como, I don't know, I'm, I'm starting to like it. Y también es como nada más, like it's gaming, it actually has like some smart part to it. Like you gotta be interested in the story. You gotta like have certain hand-eye coordination. Like, It's, it's something that's fun and it's also beneficial, you know? Y, I don't know, it's just... I wanted to fuck around, así que... No, a mí me gusta mucho porque siento que... A mí me cuesta mucho estar quieto, estar sentado en un solo sitio y enfocarme en algo como en televisión o algo. Sí. Por eso, pero me gusta jugar porque siento... Mi cerebro siempre está trabajando, mis manos están trabajando, no siento que estoy quieto, a pesar de que estoy ahí tirado en el sofá. Exacto. Pero no me siento que estoy quieto, o sea, siempre tengo que estar pendiente de algo, pendiente de lo otro o oh, oh, just like rage screaming cuando juego online yo estaba, ayer estaba jugando con, con un amigo y, y sus amigos sí. tenemos como un grupo y, y tienen como un grupo de ellos ellos son de Panamá, ni, nunca los he conocido solo un amigo, uno de mis amigos sí. y nunca, pero, pero ya juego con ellos todo el tiempo y ayer fue la primera vez que I raged, como I raged <risa> en el voice chat, me salieron unas cosas que yo dije tengo que ir a terapia, hermano. Porque me salió. ¡A ti te parió el ano de Judas! Y ahí de repente todo el mundo se empezó a reír. Y yo dije, no, tengo que ir a terapia. Tengo que ir a terapia. No tengo puede que ir a ser. terapia, porque ¿de dónde salió eso? ¿Qué estaban jugando? Call of Duty. No, qué mano. No, dude, Rage. ¿Tú rompiste alguna vez un, un controller? No. ¿Reventar un controller? No. No, nunca. No, yo nunca he sido violento. Honestamente, yo creo que lo único que, que me hizo romper... Rompí uno en mi vida y fue cuando mis padres no estaban en casa. Y lo, me lo reventé. O sea, literalmente fue... Y no fue el, el, el PlayStation, fue el mando de, del Wii. Y fue a propósito. Bueno, pero es que, no fue. Es, que lo, es que los mandos del Wii, tú los mirabas y se rompían. Sí, honestamente. Empecemos pero por ahí. O sea... Muchas veces se me escapó de la mano, hice todo lo que, lo que todo el mundo hizo, como lanzar el mando a, a la tele cuando jugamos bowling. Hice todo eso, pero nunca partí nada. Hay una pantalla de inicio, Vlad, que te dice, amárrate esa mierda a la mano para que no la lances a la televisión. Te juro que creo que he utilizado la Wii mil veces y de mil veces creo que me puse esa mierda tres. Tres veces me la usé el, el, el strap. Pero sí, por eso mismo, eh, creo que perdí en béisbol en, estaba jugando Wii Sports y era muy pequeño. Tenía como, no sé, muy, muy pequeño. Tenía nueve años. Y agarré y perdí contra mi, contra mi cousin. <ríe> y agarré y, y sabía que le iba a pegar a él. Y en vez de pegarle a él, eh, cogí el mando y lo reventé contra el suelo. Y él al parquet, ¿no? O sea, un niño de nueve años y parquet tampoco puede hacer tanto daño, dirías, ¿no? Dude, esa mierda... O sea, ¿sabes cómo cuando tocas algo y salen mil pedazos? O sea, te juro que todos los botones se fueron por... O sea, se, se fueron por todo lado. Y lo peor de eso era que no era mi mando. Era el mando de mi cousin. 
Y obviamente esa noche nos la comimos los dos. Él, porque tenía que comérsela, porque es un país de Eastern Europe, y yo porque, me, yo porque lo reventé, ¿sabes? Y sí, sí. nunca me va a por... Esa fue la primera y la última vez que reventé un, un mando. Sí. Bueno, pero si me makes you feel any better, los controles de Wii, tú los miras muy duro y se rompen. Dude, no. It's like... Un, I have never seen something as flimsy as that. Y en, el, el Wii en, 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 en sí mismo es como, dude, it's, siempre lo tenía como que... I'm, I almost felt like my fingers were pushing through it when I was holding it. Like, creía que se estaba como encerando. It was weird. Así, así se siente el Switch. ¿Sí? ¿Sí? Nunca me lo compré. Sabía, me, me, acordé, me acordé el otro día cuando te estabas pensando en comprártelo hace rato y te lo compraste. Y... Sí. Está pensando, ¿qué tal el Switch? ¿Lo, lo sigues utilizando? ¿Cuándo es te lo compraste? Es muy divertido. Es muy, eh, en 2019. Como a finales de 2019. ¿sí? No. Finales de 2018. Dos años. Uf. Wow. Sí. Pasó Pero bien. es muy divertido. Más que nada, más que nada lo uso para jugar juegos que son para, para hacer con otra gente. Super Smash, sí. Mario Kart, Mario Party, todo eso. Has a, it has a few games that are good to play alone, like um, Zelda y todo eso, pero, pero más que nada es para jugar con mis amigos Super Smash o Mario Kart o Mario Party. Yeah. Um, yo estaba pensando en, en gaming y a dónde está yendo todo el gaming world. Ahora que ha salido el, el, a PlayStation 5, yo estaba pensando como que Even if I had the chance of buying retail right now, no creo que lo haría porque aún siento que no, I didn't live all of the PS4 yet. Como que I didn't get burnt out on PS4. Como siento que aún es como algo nuevo para mí. Y entonces quiero seguir jugando juegos en la, en la Play 4 antes de sacar, antes de comprarme la Play 5. Pero sé que mucha gente está como burning through that shit. Y como la Play 5 igual no será... Un, un gran advance, like what else can you do to it, sabes como que what other layer can you add to gaming creo que le dieron un toque muy social con lo de esports and competing and, and all that but como ves el futuro del gaming en, en los siguientes 10 años así como like do you think people are still gonna play games or is it gonna like decrease ¿Tú prefieres que hagamos esto en español o en inglés o...? Lo que sea. ¿Seguro? Dude. ¿Y tu audience? <laughs> Ay, my audience can understand both Spanish and English in this case. And if they okay. can't, and if they can't, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll probably put subtitles underneath, honestly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so going back to your question. First off, yes, I think in 10 years people are still going to play. In fact, video games are one of the industries that's not going away for a long time. Okay. They're not going away. They just have better and better years every year that passes. And now with the PS5, if I get to buy retail, will I do it? Yes, I will. Why? Mostly because my PS4 is old and it's been used a lot and it's hanging by a thread. Like, Any day now, I'm waiting for it to die. And every day I turn it on, I play. It sounds like a motherfucking airplane. And I'm like, <laughs> today's the day. Hope, like, luckily, it's not the day, but yeah, it's a reality. Any day can happen. It freezes. It like does everything. Some games just don't run. I mean, they run, but they run poorly. And and then, you know. As you say, like, what else can they do to the PS5? Yeah. To a certain extent, it's, it's true. Especially early on, like, nowadays. But to this, there is a lot they can do. The PS5 can run at a higher FPS. Right. It can render things faster. Both textures. Do you ever play a game and you're like, oh, this is great. But then, like... The water texture takes like 20 fucking seconds to load and then it just looks like some blurry mosaic shit. Yeah. It loads textures faster. It loads the game faster, resulting on like way shorter like waiting screen times. Right. For what I've seen, short to almost nothing. Damn. And then 
the one big thing that they did with the PS5 that I've read, not that I've been lucky to get my hands on one, <laughs> but the one thing that I've read is that the real, the real star of the show is the controller. Okay, how so? What does it, it have? It has this thing called haptic, haptic feedback or some shit like yeah. that. I don't know. But it's much more immersive. The way you hold it, like, say you're playing any shooting game. Right. And you're like, you know how like most shooting games you shoot with like the, the back, the yeah. back buttons, the triggers. It makes a resistance that imitates an actual like trigger. Damn. Yeah, it's an actual like much more immersive. Wow. Than anything else. That's what most reviews that I've read of the PS5 say. Like the real difference lays in the in the in the controller, in the PS5 controller. Are they gonna make any like virtual reality based off of that? Like that you can pair to your PlayStation 5, like some headset? I don't know. I think it's compatible with like the same gear that they had on the on the on other the PS4. one. PS4. Yeah. Because of the haptic, think like it's because of the immersive. I don't think it's it. worth it yet because they haven't made anything specific for it. Right, but they will. Truly, they will. In a year or so, people will stop making the games thinking about the PS4 users. Right, they still do. Right, but in a year or so, development development houses will start will stop thinking about PS4 users and like even if the game runs on PS4 which more, most likely they'll stop running, even if it runs on PS4, they will start thinking on, like, how does this game better fit this gen of consoles, PS5 and Xbox Series X, S, whatever the fuck it's right, called. Right, 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 yeah. So, and that's only natural, and, like, that's also why I want to buy a PS5. I don't have a rush, because as of right now, people still think of the people like you and me who have a PS4 and enjoy it, but the truth is, like, they're just gonna stop doing it. And it's only to further exp further better the experience of the PS5. Especially with this gray, like, thing with the controller, like, the haptic feedback or whatever. Dude, that sounds dope. That's something that, like, you have to take advantage on, because yeah. it is as immersive as your hands can feel i guess i imagine like maybe in fifa it's gonna have like a, you're gonna have to like press it slower like it's gonna make you press like slower because like that's what it takes to like load up a kick you know you know instead of being just like kick down you know you have to like yeah like you have a bit of resistance you know like it would be pretty cool i don't know now that you're telling me i'm imagining all the ways that they they might be able to use yeah. it you know, other than shooter but and obviously i don't know much more about no, it right, right, uh, right. because I haven't had like hands-on experience. I've only read like the reviews and things like that, but Oh yeah. I'm a dumbass too. You know, I went into this without looking at the PS five. Like I, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't get almost any interest in the PS five just because I was like, I don't have the money for it yet. And there's like, there was so many other things on the list that I was like, It's gonna be a while. So now that it's getting into my sphere, I'm starting to learn about it. So I'm completely uneducated on the matter. I had interest, but not the I want to buy it type of interest, and that changed because have you heard of Have you heard of the tale of Cyberpunk 2077? I know it's a game that just came out, and there's yes. a lot. There's a bunch of controversy. I, I yes. what's up? So what's up with that? It's a game that was announced a hundred fucking years ago when the dinosaur roamed Earth. <laughs> it was announced and then it just kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed and it finally came out. And as advertised, it was going to come out for PC as every fucking game does. Yeah. For PS4 and Xbox One, whatever the PS4 sister yeah. is. Um, and it was going to run on PS5 and the new Xbox with a future update to come to like make it specific for PS5. Right. Right? But they advertised it. It's going to run on PS4. That's what they said. Right. And all the, like, early access reviews and things like that, like, web, like, video games they give to, like, reporters on websites do, like, they were all on PC, which, like, seemed a little suspicious to a lot of people at first, but they were, like, whatever. They just want us to see 
the most enhanced graphics possible because it's a game that was like among the many claims it was supposed to look absolutely stunning right so whatever it came out and like the reviewers like the early reviewers did it on pc and they gave it super high score and whatever so whatever then finally the release date comes and it's fucking mess on ps4 and xbox one like a mess like I bought it. I, I pre-ordered it because I was hyped too for the game. Yeah. And it's a mess. It has bugs left and right. And this is coming from a generation a generation of people that have played video games so much and have seen such an advancement in video games that we are used to bugs. Yeah. We really are. If you play a decent amount of video games, you know every game you play has like a bug here and there. Like you see this fucking box floating here and whatever. And <laughs> yeah. we don't... We don't we, <laughs> We're so used to them that we don't see them anymore. Yeah. This is coming from a generation of people, a specific group of people that play so much that we are, like, we normalize, like, not seeing bugs, and it's fine. So the fact that, like, everyone that played on a PS4 and Xbox One sees so many bugs tells you how bad it is. Yeah. Then, I get okay, then that's, okay, that wouldn't be a big deal if it was only that. The textures take forever to load. Sometimes they just don't. Oh shit! Yeah, the game, the game sometimes like starts running super slow, and then it crashes my PS4, like every hour. So I play for about four hours total, at least every forty to fifty minutes. It crashes my PlayStation Four. Damn. So of course there was a lot of controversy about that, and actually the the studio C- CD Projekt Red is the name of the studio. Right. Their their stocks came down like twenty something percent. Holy the shit! Because of release, because, because of, of the like, shitty release yeah, on PS4, because of the backlash, yeah. Holy fuck! Then, whatever they release a statement saying, we're gonna release multiple patches between now and February that will make it run much smoother. Whatever, whatever, whatever. It's our fault. Just taking the blame. And then they said, but if you don't want to wait and you're not happy with your product, before you can refund it. Now, they say this in an official, like, statement, and it makes you think, like, oh, obviously, like, well, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but, like, they make you think, like, okay, obviously, this is, like, they talked with, like, the Sony PlayStation people and the Microsoft Xbox people right. to, like, deal with something. Because me buying something on the PlayStation Store, it's, like, a transaction between me and Sony. There's yeah. no one else, you know? Like, it's the studio's product but like the transaction is me and sony yeah exactly so you think you would think like okay they talk to sony and like whatever they're gonna do refunds i try to riff i among like many other people try to refund it and the very kind represent like customer representative just says like oh once you've downloaded and played a digital download game you can't really ask for a refund which like I it makes sense I guess like I'm not gonna right. yeah, it because does. like it makes sense, but then I'm like okay so they said I could refund it but turns out I can't holy no um, man why and then obviously that led to even more backlash which is like the last thing they needed but the the thing they deserved because I'm sorry like I don't care if you made a absolutely stunning game for PC. But you can't cut corners and, like, release an unfinished game on PS4. Either delay the whole game or, like, just delay the console version. That's what it was, yeah. But whatever. So, later on, like, a few days later, Sony PlayStation releases a a statement saying, we understand that people are unhappy with Cyberpunk, whatever, whatever. We strive to have a high level of, like, customer service. That's why we have pulled out the game out of our PlayStation Store. They got rid of it on the PlayStation Store, which is, like, it hasn't happened ever, especially with, like, a game this big, you know? Yeah. And we will be offering full refund to everyone who purchased the game. And all you need to do, you didn't even need to fill a form. Literally, you only need to log in and click a button. They had a separate section on the website only for cyberpunk 27 2077 refunds and all you have to do be logged in on your account and you have to click request refund and that whoever whoever advised sony on that one definitely needs a raise bro 
Like, holy shit, that's good. I, that I mean, that's and it's not even their fault. And I mean, no, of course it's not Sony's fault. Like it's as I said, like it's the studio's fault. Yeah. And, like, the game was re- was delayed for, like six times. Like, okay, yeah, whatever. It would suck if you delay it again, but might as fucking well do it. You've already done it six times. We have no expectations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we had expectations because the hype was a lot, but we had no expectations for release because you've delayed it like six times. So, like, yeah. just do it again and say, hey, this is why. Yeah. You know, or just release the PC one. Like, apparently, everyone that's gotten on PC that I know of or like I've heard of is very happy and like good for them because they got what they were promised. Right. Just release it on PC and like make console people wait. Like, it's better to wait than give us like a literally broken product. No, no pasó like, eso con GTA también. No. GTA 5? Didn't that happen with GTA 5? No, Five? that released on time. That released both on both consoles at the same yeah. time on on P- PC I, and on PS4? Yeah. I think so. But the thing is like it's just just like delay it like why would you do that and think there wasn't gonna be any consequences right and you can't tell me that you didn't fucking test that game there wasn't a single person in all of that studio that ha- that owned a ps4 like yeah <laughs> just it doesn't make any sense but they load up the screen they're like yep good to go <laughs> yeah it's just And they are trying to fix it. Like, they've released, like, three patches already, but they said, like, there's going to be two big ones, one in January, one in February, that are, like, will, like, get the game, like, really going. Right. When I requested my refund, I will probably buy it again, like, when it's fixed or when I get my hands on a PS5 because it runs fairly well on the PS5. Oh, nice. I still want to play it. I play for a little, I told you, like, maybe four, five hours total. I play mostly some side missions because I didn't want. I knew I wasn't gonna play it through at that point, right? Because you can't really. It's supposed to have a really good story, and what I played of it, it's like it's a very well narrated game, like very well. And I, I was like, I saw myself from playing the main quest because I was like, I'm not gonna spoil this quest, this like story for me if yeah. it's broken. So I play some side missions and. It was fun. It was really fun. It was really well narrated and all that. But then I stopped and I was like, okay, I don't want to get more immersed in this. Like I'm at a point where I can like easily stop. Right. Like jump back in it and have a real first play once so, it works. So apart from um apart from the fact that you guys waited so long for this game, Like, you know, apart from this game letting you down, has there been any other video games that you bought and uh, were, like, not so happy with? Because I can tell you one that I was, like, I was not really happy with. And I bought this game, um, well, not this game, this collection of three. It was the first, it was the Ezio Auditore collection of the Assassin's Mm. Creed. So it had the three games. I think it was Assassin's 1, 2, and and um revelations if i'm not wrong and i played revelations i I never played revelations i bought those two which i played on playstation 3 and plus revelations which i never played in my life and i played revelations because it was a game that i remembered i don't know how many years ago was a hype like everyone was like oh my god you know and when i played revelations it was one of those games that like you could run through the walls your hand would like get stuck through the walls it would be uh you would play a game finish a mission and then instead of like letting you save it would send you back home and i was thinking like damn this was like 2018 i'm like thinking damn there's still a lot of games that are patchy all right i stopped playing games for a while i come back and i get ufc 3 which was like a year later ufc 3 uh i was like okay i remember ufc 2 ufc 2 was like you could uh, go up a weight class you could challenge a few people but there was no like press conferences there was no like interaction whatever so ufc 3 everyone was expecting like this kind of sort of engagement ufc 3 was ufc 2 with a few features added 
which had nothing to do with the whole like social aspect of it. And then I got UFC 4. And then you don't have UFC 4 yet, right? No. Okay. So the jump that I expected from UFC 2 to 3 happened from 2 to 3 to 4. Like they took two games to make a change that they had to make from 2 to 3. I guess it's a little different for sports games because people expect this like big improvements, but like, right. <clears throat> like really, what can you do in a sports game? The sport hasn't changed. What have changed are like the rankings and things like that. And like, maybe, yeah, you can implement like a little like better movement mechanic. Like, you know, like what I was thinking is that it's been, what's been happening to sports and it's kind of sad is that the games in order to like attract the mass have to become more less about the fucking sport and more about the shit surrounding the sport. Like they've added in UFC 4, they've added like tweets and replies, but you could do that. Like you do certain things like that in UFC 3, but in this one, you can actually like tweet people. You can like, uh, you can choose to like promote your stuff by shit talking your opponent and then like replying to your opponent's shit talking and then during a press conference you can tell tell him shit and it's like you know it's cool thing for ufc but now like in 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 soccer you know they have a lot of the things that are on the outside in like the career mode you know like what kind of i remember playing soccer manager like what kind of house you want to buy you know and like they kind of like glamorize the outside of sports you know i guess it's cool for some people like the whole like social aspect that they've added yeah that to me, I couldn't care less because, first off, if you watch the UFC, like, in real life, yeah, that's the worst fucking part of it because most of these, like, athletes that are that excel at their sport, they're fucking cringy. Like, they're really cringy. Yeah. Like, every time they tweet something, I'm like, Jesus, fuck, who's your <laughs> PR person? Fire them and then fire yourself. Like, because, like, literally, like, that's the worst part and like the whole like drama like it gets to a point where like you're supposed to be watching this like sport which is like a very real sport like the fights are very much real the injuries are very much real but then they have some like dramatic twist like that makes it look like wwe and you're right i don't understand what what is going on because the big difference between wwe and ufc is like in one of them People actually get hurt, actually yeah. hurt each other. Yeah. But like, then you want to have this like big drama, and I guess that it's, I guess, okay, it's like the drama creates hype, which creates promotion content, which creates money, and like, fine to an extent. Like, if you want to promote like a bad blood battle, like, fine, like that's okay, that's cool with me personally. Like, it worked for Kenny and Taylor Swift, but, <laughs> but. <laughs> I but think like, that what happened was... They just want to make this drama with everything. Yeah, I think since Conor McGregor... Because, look, as much as I hate to say it, I think that Conor McGregor started a trend where... I, I don't think he started it. I think he solidified a trend where you have not only to shit-talk... Because everybody has been shit-talking. Chael Sonnen was uh, shit-talking. Uh, but people before him were shit-talking, you know? It's one of, like... It's a mind game, you know? And it's also ways to promote your fight. It's not something new. It's not something that he invented. But he took it to a new level because at first he used to shit talk and say, I'm going to kick your ass in the second round. I'm going to put you to sleep. And he used to do it. And then he built it up and he built up hype. And then he built up this like, he's like, oh, this is the guy that has been shit talking and proving his words. And so he built this hype where he could say and do whatever the fuck he wanted. Like Eddie Alvarez fight, he showed up. I don't know when, like, he showed up late, uh, took his guy's belt, like, showed up in a fucking uh, mink fur coat and they still had a tag on and did all that stupid ass shit. And then mauled the dude. This guy got two punches. The champion got two punches on him and he got the two titles. And then from there on, he started doing the Floyd Mayweather and he was like, oh shit, this guy got so far by fucking shit talking and you know granted a very fucking good fighter like it's one of my favorite fighters but shit talked his way to the top did all this fucking drama and now he's fighting the one of the best boxers if not the best boxer in the history 
and it was all like because of blah blah and it was all promotion and from then on it kind of went south you know but until then shit talking got the money and then dana white got that check as well and he was like we're no, gonna allow course. him to do it, anything because this is gonna get him. us views it worked from him and he did change the sport and like I'm in a good way talk- too no yeah he changed his sport for good and i'm not saying like oh she's talking bad like I, that's not what i'm saying no i'm just saying like you don't need to make every fight a big drama just like look at it objectively it's just like it's not a part of the sport it's really not a part of the sport like you're to me like you're just taking away from like what the sport really is and you just want to make it like oh this guy tweeted something in 2011 about this guy's to be wife to be or whatever and it's like did that even really happen first of all and then it's like (laughs) yeah just like you don't need to make every fight about it like there's some fights where there's gonna be bad blood like like real bad blood and that's fine like i mean i think it's a little tacky to like make a promotion video off of that but dude not one but like how many did they yeah, make of this apparently fucking... me and the ufc connor and khabib bro <laughs> the ufc marketing department are very different pages but yeah <laughs> then again oh the God. average ufc watcher is quite the being so yeah <laughs> i understand if those videos are not made for quite me. the bro <laughs> yeah but it's just like you don't and like that's fine but you don't need to make every fight about this like don't try to make a drama where there isn't one like just like make it more about the sport and just like try to make drama less of a part of it like don't let the drama outweigh the like the actual skill the sport the 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 sport and the skill that it takes yeah. Because otherwise it will just be WWE. Right. The way I say it is a spectrum, right? On right. this side of the spectrum, you have more drama, less about the sport, which is WWE. On this end of the spectrum, you have like kickboxing and boxing and Muay Thai and like Muay Thai, yeah. Where there while in boxing there's there's some drama here and there, yes, there is, but like it doesn't outweigh the sport and the the fighter's skill. Right. And then you have UFC, who's like constantly like in the, it's in the middle, but it's constantly, which is not a bad place to be, but it like constantly like trying to lean more and more and more on the WWE model, which is, I guess from a marketing perspective, like it could work, but it's just like, it's not little, only WWE me, model. Disrespectful. Yeah. But they, they're trying to get WWE, but they're trying to get just commercial in general. And mm-hmm. that's the fear. That's my fear too. Like, their their attempt at becoming commercial is going to steer them towards WWE model instead of a NBA model instead of a NFL model you know like you're going like you're going to be the go to american one because until now they're letting people fucking go to Bellator they're letting people go granted a lot of them old people a lot of them like whatever but they're not the best when it comes to treating their fighters including like Khabib like honestly that fight, you know, like, I was one of the, I am one of the biggest Conor McGregor fans, but it was like, God damn, holy shit, like, they allowed him to get away with a lot of stuff, like, to say a lot of stuff, and then Khabib beat the fucking living out of him, but they allowed him to say whatever, and then I think that they got escalated to a point where, dude, you know, when the fighters start, like, there's no, like, real, they, you have so much money that there's no more, like, problems in your life, so you create them, you know? They started believing, I think. I don't know how much Habib, but I think Conor started believing this shit. Brett, this guy could have, like, well, started killing, it's, killing people, just, you know? Who knows? That's just like, a psychological, crazy. like, factor. Like, once you get so high, there is no other way but down. Yeah. Which, like, happens in everything in life. Like, it happens not only to Conor McGregor, but it happens to celebrities, you know? Like, exactly. they get so famous so fast, so young, and then, like, they reach a point where it's like, well, now what? Like, once you get to the top, the only way you can go, it's like, you either stay there or it's down. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's hard. And it's like, like, which is like, fine. And Conor McGregor, I guess it's 
in a way a separate case because he did make the sport much more mainstream. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's just going to work for everyone. You have like dudes out there who go into press conference like dressed all spiffy and trying to be like the baddest dude there and it's like it's like some some motherfucker some like bland ass motherfucker like what's the name of this guy that like fought against Pantera recently um not not the Korean zombie um no after that and they had to make two fights because there was like an eye poke that made them stop the wasn't it fight. wasn't it against Abit it's the who the fuck is this guy oh guy. um Stephen Stephen uh no Yeah, Stephen something. Stephen something, yeah. Who you have this guy there? who, like, yeah. his most famous moment was when he was roasted by Conor McGregor by not yeah. knowing, it, well, not even knowing his name. And, like, you have guys like this who, like, walk Ohio Mighty trying to, like, pretend to be the baddest dude and, like, having beef with everyone that crosses their way. And then it's, like, it's, like, first off, it doesn't fit your persona. And, like, just don't, just try to find your persona. Don't try to... Yeah, did what Conor McGregor does. Like, it's not our fault that you're still hurt because you got roasted on national TV when Conor McGregor. Right, like, right. I I don't know if this is only me, but I feel like in the latest, you know, months or year, I've started liking more the kind of guys that, you know, they're not just fucking quiet, you know, Stipe Miocic fucking <laughs> dudes, because you know, all respect to him, you know, he's like you know, firefighter really good champion i mean the greatest heavyweight in my opinion that walked in ufc and this dude's fucking boring man like i mean he's uh his press conferences are but he he's like a really cool dude if you watch him he pranks his no, wife no like and stuff. it's it's but, it's fine not everyone has that yeah that like speaking skill which is something like yeah he could if he wanted he could work on it for like yeah. you know like the purpose of like better selling yourself not as a marketing tool but the selling yourself is like you're obviously a skilled dude you might be yeah a champion for a while like yeah might as well make people like you but like you don't for that you don't need to be all like mcgregoring things yeah you, you don't know? need it's like, to which is like to. he very well no he doesn't need to oh yeah it's fine no. but and like it's just like for example you have Jorge Masvidal You have the guy like him who, like, he's obviously a guy that's, like, always being very outspoken, always being very straightforward and things like that. And, like, yeah, he can shit talk. He can, like, do the whole bad motherfucker thing, which is fine. It fits his persona. Yeah. But the more famous he gets, you see, the more he follows Conor McGregor's footsteps. Yeah. Didn't he just, like, announce his mezcal brand wearing a Versace robe? Like, yeah, what name does it scream to you? What name comes to <laughs> mind when I tell you, like, I'm announcing my my alcohol brand wearing a Versace robe? <laughs> like, Conor McGregor, who did bro, that exactly? Like, it's just like imitating. It's like, don't go down that rabbit hole. Like, we know how that plays out, and and honestly, like, yeah, you did have amazing performance back to back, which is great and all, but like, focus more on your career goals or just like keep being yourself without trying to like be this Conor McGregor phenomenon. You're already famous as fuck as sis. Yeah. This is who I, I mean, like. That, I like that five second knockout made you like a, a star. You don't need to like try to imitate the other biggest star in the UFC. Exactly. And I feel like I need, this is like, you've touched on an important point. Be authentic, be yourself. This is the kind of person I've, I've told you, I've started to steer towards the kind of guys that can shit talk, but the kind of guys that are not just shit talking like somebody else and then going in and doing nothing, you know, like Adesanya for me is an incredible example of a dude who is like, I'm going to pick you apart like this and I'm going to do this and this and this to you and then goes in and fucking does it. Like straight Adesanya up is a picks case them that apart. I want to see to me, it works. I mean, the dancing intro was a bit cringy for me, but I'm just a very judge judgmental person. And like the anime I, dancing, yeah, the whole like dance crew thing. But right, it's fine. It fits his persona, and he's a case that I'm like, okay, this dude's cool because like this is who he really is. It's a case that I'm very interested in. And like, I want to see where it goes because right now it reminds me a lot, not in his fighting style, but like 
in his way of being of like really early Conor McGregor, you know, like as you said, like yeah, you pick your part this way and then go technical, and and really things technical, like that. yeah. I want to see where it ends. I really hope he keeps true to who he is and doesn't try to like. His downfall might be going up the weight. I think the downfall, the the the, or maybe the reality check might be he's gonna go up, challenge John Jones or or Jan Blakovitz, and then lose. Do nobody ask? Like, there is not a single person in the world that asks for that fight. Yeah, nobody asks for Israel that fight. Israel Adesanya and Jan Blakovich. The only reason why we wanted Adesanya in light heavyweight was to fight John Jones because there is beef between them. Yeah. But whatever. They can do whatever they want. I've honestly, like, this past year and a half, I've lost a lot of faith in the UFC because I'm like, they just keep putting this whole like really this really like dramatic marketing strategy as a priority yeah like instead of you know fights that matter fights that are good for the sport i do have to give it to them that in the year that most fucking sports suck dick the one the one sport that i can say that didn't lose entertainment not only i don't i don't get it so much on the outside but within the actual fight within the uh, cage i can tell you that ufc for me continued being one of the most interesting sports because they managed to get these fights in the islands they get to they managed to make these fights in the states that were still open no of course and they managed and... to put on like a fucking show but they're getting to the point where they're announcing all this big thing that they're gonna do with the island and the entertainment and like they're trying to make it again, like gamify. You know, this is the you're trying yeah. to gamify a sport and that's it's, about. And this is fighting. literally the last, the last sport that it should be a game. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not it's a game. Like, you don't play fighting, you know. Yeah, and I guess it, it sucks because like, for like people like you and me and most of the people I know that like like MMA. It kind of sucks because we really like it for the sports and what the sport stands for and things like that. But I guess it works for the UFC because, again, most of the the fans of UFC are, you know, really bro people. Yeah, not a lot of them wait, think first, hit later you know <laughs> yeah people that don't really understand how submission works but they just want to see someone bleed and it's, it's twist fine. his dick like, twist his dick <laughs> yeah like it, i guess it works for them and like they understand that that's their big audience and right right they're targeting towards that but like it just sucks and it's a little disrespectful towards the sport but what about bare knuckle fighting no, that's not. That's not <laughs> even like that. Shouldn't be a thing, dude. That's serious brain damage that it, all of them are getting, bro. But it's raw. I can respect it. Like I can respect people that get in there. That's not... that sport is hepatitis and CTE. That's what it is, right? It's it's, it's like fucking underground fighting, dude. I how the fuck did they even get licensed? They fight I'm, in these countries that I'm they don't sure really need licenses. I'm sure it's not in most states. <laughs> yeah. They probably go to Europe to do it. No, Paige Van Sant, Paige Van Sant is making her bare knuckle yeah. fighting debut, like I think February or something like that. Oh, I can't wait. Which is, I, I, I am interested in see how that plays out. Am I gonna watch the fight? No, because I don't want to watch that crap. <laughs> but I am interested to see and in how her bare knuckle fighting career turns out because. Paige Vincent is an interesting case. It's. She did have some good fights early in her career, but she got really famous for being like this, like, you know, this, like, really, like, all American doll looking yeah. like, person in the UFC. Yeah. And. Which is fine. Like, if you got it, like, 
use it. Of course, you're right. Which is fine, but then later in her career, like she started having some like not ideal fights. She started losing a lot and it's it's fine. Like it's not it's not like something bad. Like you get outworked by your opponent like quite often. Of course. And she's doing this whole like bare knuckle fighting thing to like show the world how like I am not a pretty face like i'm not just my pretty face i am a fighter which is great yeah i respect that <clears throat> but i want to see how it plays out i mean who's she, she fighting knows, i don't know i don't even know who fights in bare knuckle sports um but yeah, yeah i mean she knows she clearly knows the risk of like going to bare knuckle fighting right and i know she makes <clears throat> Sorry, I know she makes like a decent amount of money off of her looks in social media. Yeah. And I mean, she knows the risk of going in it. She knows how it might affect it, but she's doing it to show the world how like she's a fighter rather than, you know, just this pretty Instagram girl. And it's it's great for her. I just want to see how it plays out. Right. I, I'm 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 interested. I don't think they have an uh, an official opponent yet. Beck Rowling says Paige Van Zandt has no hope in bare knuckle boxing against. I think she's fighting Beck Rawlings. Oh, was wasn't Beck Rawlings also in the UFC? <coughs> I think she was a wrestler, wasn't she? She's an Australian mixed martial artist. Oh, uh, let me just check because I don't want to talk shit, you know. Especially for MMA, I respect the community too much. Uh, she fought. For Bellator. Mm -hmm. She's competing. She's still competing in the flyweight division of the Bellator. And yeah, she's ranked. Bella... I don't know what she's ranked right now, but Bellator, she has... um Bellator doesn't have rankings. Oh right. You just it's like yeah. it's like boxing kinda, right? Yeah. Um Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What'd you think about the Tyson fight? I didn't watch it, but I mean, I, I'm okay with it. Like if two old people want to go and beat the shit out of each other, I'm fine with it. It was fun. It. it was entertaining. As long as it's two old people doing it, I'm okay with it. Um, Again, I don't follow boxing that much, really. No, I know you don't follow boxing as much. That's why I was asking. But you didn't watch it. I had to just because... I could add it to the list of people that I could see live. I know I didn't see prime time Tyson in prime time Roy Jones Jr., but they were both names that I grew up with. People are like, yeah, Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson. And I have faint like memories of like watching his highlights before a fight. No, of, you know, but with my dad would watch the fight, but I couldn't watch the fight. So I watched the highlights the next day. And I don't know. I remember that. And I was like, shit, I got to watch this fight. And yeah, it wasn't like that great. Like, no, the and big I mean, ass down I'm, by round one. <laughs> like round I'm one sure, I'm sure it was great, and I, I'm like happy they did it. I really much prefer this. Like, you know, there's these two old dudes. So like this, like, I mean, they're still like I'm saying old dudes. If they're like geriatric, they're like right. in better shape than I am, clearly. Right. <laughs> but um, but I mean, I prefer like this is to people that like you know. They have been retired. They have like. They hung up their gloves and things like that, and they decide to come back for one, like money fight. And like, I'm okay with that. Right. I'm okay with that. Like, I'm gonna put you uh, I think it proves an MMA. That, I'm yeah. gonna put you an MMA example. Yeah. Chuck Little wants to come back. Yeah. To for one money fight to the UFC. I mean. If they put it against, I mean, Tito Ortiz or right, even Charles Sonnen. Charles Sonnen, yeah, that would be a good. Even fight. even Clyde Guido or some one of these like guys that are still fighting but are clearly washed like washed out. Like, yeah, I'm okay with that because like it's like a comparable s skill level, right? But like, say they do like Chocolate L versus, I don't know, like John Jones. 
He's really no, no, like, would, I am not, not okay fun. with that shit because, like, how are you <laughs> gonna put a primetime fighter and this, like, dude, like, that high, like, beyond their age, like, they can be fine at whatever age, but, like, he's clearly not conditioned enough to, like, be fighting primetime fighters now. Yeah, he was because saying he stuff fought. like, he hasn't fought, he hasn't fought in so long, you know, it's like, yeah, he was on Joe Rogan saying maybe he was gonna fight Anthony, like, he was looking to see maybe who's he was gonna fight after this fight, you know, maybe Anthony Joshua and stuff like that, and I was like, I clearly saw once he was fighting, he was like, there's no fucking way this man's going to get in with Anthony Joshua. They get, he's going to get, like, like he's scary. He would stay in there, don't get me wrong. No, I, It's Mike Tyson still. Like, he looked good. Yeah. But the speed and the stuff is not, it's, it's, it can't. Like, you cannot right now. Maybe if he continued training and fighting for a while, but it's, a, like, it's still, like, you know, yeah, a but long the other, time. The other, qu- the other question is, like, can he stay and fight for a while? Like, Right, exactly. Like, I mean, if he can, that's amazing for him. But, like, like age is something that you can't really fight that much against, you know? Right. So I, I think so, too. But, I mean, if they decide to make, like, Anthony Joshua and, like, Mike Tyson, I mean, that's cool. I'm sure they're, they're going to have some, like, special rule set. Yeah, they have to. But they're making, they're making Floyd... Um, they're making Floyd Logan Paul. First of all, they even no. got the wrong brother. Logan. No, they yeah, they got the wrong brother. They got the one that hasn't won anything. Yeah, the other dude actually proved that he can fight. On my opinion, uh, not, he proved not that the... he can fight against a basketball yeah. player. Yeah, no, he can fight like at this level of like beginner amateur. Like he like he showed that he's athletic and the the, good, the punch sure. that the last punch that he threw was a good punch. Like no, it was he's intentional. obviously skilled and he probably can hold his own against like. A professional fighter again. He's a bitch. <laughs> a started professional fighter. Yeah. Someone that's had a few fighters under the belt. Like, he's not gonna fight against Fulman. How like and not even Logan? Jake Paul who like actually has won something. Yeah. And like I first of all, Logan Paul has never fought without a headgear on. Yeah. That's the first thing. Like, how are you going to put him against Floyd Mayweather? But he's a lot t- I don't know. He, it seems... I think he's going to get knocked the it's fuck like out. A, but he's a lot taller. That's why it makes it interesting, you know? It makes it interesting. But it also makes it fucked and easier for Floyd Mayweather to connect a liver punch. Yeah. True. But, I mean, I get... I'm sure they're going to have, again, a special rule set. They're going to have something. Yeah. What kind they're, of gloves they need he's to have, have to a special wear. rule set and... Whatever. Logan Paul has to fight with one hand behind his back. <laughs> nah, I, 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 it's gonna be interesting, but I don't know if this was the best thing f- to do. And it is confirmed. Like I saw it on his thing. It's confirmed that's gonna no, happen. It right? is confirmed. And it's again, it's an exhibition match, which yeah. like very good for Floyd Mayweather because he is technically staying retired and he's yeah. only doing exhibition match with like special rule sets. Yeah. Which, like, turned out for him because he's clearly going to win and he's going to get a nice paycheck off of it. So, right. good for him. I don't know, but I, I think just don't, Floyd's like, really him. condone. I am much more of a, if you haven't been able to tell by now, like, I am much more of a purist when it comes to combat po- sports. Yeah. And I just don't think we should be advertising this, like, youtuber fights like this i mean i think we should when they it's like youtuber versus to... youtuber or yeah. like or like things like that but like they've gotten people into boxing point... you know yeah like, that's the good part like tyson said after the fight like thank you to all these people like youtube fighters they're promoting the sport and getting people interested and it's true like people that are watching this they might go and read about more about boxing they might go and watch other fights they might go and explore this world and it helps build a community but what kind of community yeah you know? but like <laughs> it's fine like if like youtuber wants to fight another youtuber youtuber wants to fight a yeah. singer or a basketball player or like whoever's the case like that's fine would i make it beyond like the like the co-main event to Mike Tyson fight? No, I fucking wouldn't. I would put skill fighters there. Yeah. But or make a separate event for like this like YouTuber fights. Things yeah. like that. That's fine. But whatever. Regardless of where they place it, it's okay. But like once you put like this like amateur boxer YouTuber against like a world like 
like a world known star like yeah. Floyd Mayweather who like have beat has beat the shit out of like really skilled guys beat the shit out of like really famous Conor McGregor it's just like a little like again disrespectful to the sport and I yeah. keep saying this because I enjoy martial arts like I enjoy watching them I enjoy practicing them a little bit and I I really like what they what they stand for and like can really appreciate the craft of it and I don't want the, like I want more people to see that but I don't want this the quality of it being compromised for the theat the theatrics yeah and uh, in the theatrics are theatrics. fine as long as they don't compromise the quality of it but like when you put fucking Logan Paul against Floyd Mayweather, like that's clearly compromising the quality of things. Yeah, or like when Jake Paul, like when this dude motherfucker runs on, uh, runs up on Dylan Dennis, throws shit at him, and then when Dylan Dennis chases after him, he they they that's spin just away. Jake Paul being a YouTuber, but that's, that's the that's the danger for me. Knows how to do. That's the downside and the danger because these kids from YouTube are thinking we can shit talk and they're really good at trolling and whatever but like nate diaz said you need to get your ass beat for free you know like these kids if they if somebody runs upon them and they talk shit about them on on the internet it's, and that other person is not just another twitter finger uh you know walking by dude these kids might get killed you know and that's the danger everyone thinks that there can be a fighter and it's diminishing the like the the, the fighting culture to a point where it's like not everyone's a a fighter but you can yeah you can throw a fucking punch but that doesn't mean you're a fighter and yeah you can talk shit on the net but when you show up and you throw water balloons and toilet paper and then you sprint away when the guy clearly engages you by himself you're a bitch you know so they get this like on the screen persona and then when it comes down to it they're not the same person they run away yeah. the little hoes and it, they when you know it, you can talk shit but you you might get hit and they don't know that yet. Yeah. Especially with I mean, quarantining. <laughs> fighting sports is going down a whole theatrics rabbit hole, which is like, I guess good for them if it works. I know me along with like a lot of like combat sport purists are not happy about it, but is there something I can do about it? No, there not isn't. Really, I'm yeah. just another dude reading stuff on Instagram. Like what the fuck am I going to do? Like, I'm just gonna complain to it to the person that's closest to me and watch my die. So that shit, there's there's no fake in there. Yeah, there's only eight year olds trying to make money for their families, bro. That's a fucking sport where yeah. they're like, dude, there's no what drama. We need to do this so we can fucking put they, my coach. Even that, watch is like, one championship if you want. to Yeah, one. The one I'm is, honestly gonna stop watching UFC and so. Do you know what I like about one? I think it's one that does it. Like you have to weigh in at a, like you know how you typically have to weigh in at your uh, at the weight level. So say you you have to weigh in at 150. The next day you're probably gonna balloon up to 170 or whatever you were walking before you had to cut weight. Yeah. But in one championship, there's like a only like so much that you can like. I think gain or afterwards, like there's a certain rule that doesn't allow you to. That's a that's rough. That's that's like fucked up. No, like, there's like a good. There's, uh, let me let me like search it up because it's a good weight, so it makes sure that people cannot like attempt to drop like thirty kilos, you know? Because if you drop thirty kilos and then you drop and you gain another thirty yeah. kilos back, it's bad, you know? Or like thirty pounds, sorry, not kilos. Yeah, but then people will generally have to like fight at a at a higher weight class. Like, say, yeah. say, who can I give you an example? Kamaru Usman. Yeah. Say Kamaru Usman. That dude fights at 170. Right. But you know that motherfucker doesn't walk at 170. That, he's big. He's big as fuck. They, they test how hydrated you are. So, 
You know how okay. a lot of yeah, so you're not allowed to weigh okay, in so at that's the weight different. and yeah. and have they test the specific gravity of the urine, which tests how much solutes are in their urine. So if they don't have enough, it means that they're highly dehydrated and they're not qualified to fight. But then probably a lot of people that move into one have to fight at a higher at a higher yes. weight class. Yes, so everyone walks or fights around what they walk, like, which is honestly interesting. Not the not like the exact same weight. Like say if I weigh one seventy. You're not going to fight at 170, but I'm not going to fight at 145. I'm going to fight yeah. at like the, the next closest. Like, yeah. Because it is very unhealthy the way like they lose like all that water. It's fucking crazy. Down. And like, but like, say, for example, I was the example I was giving you, Kamar Usman. He fights at 170. He's a champion at 170. He's great at 170. Right. But you know he doesn't weigh anywhere close to 170. Nah, he was like big. around like 190, 200, yeah. something like that. He's big as fuck. Yeah, yeah. So he obviously loses a lot of weight to make 170. Yeah. And the next day, like he's dehydrated and all that. The next day, he's fine. He's like, again, walking at like 180, 185. It's crazy when to he see the weight. Yeah. Yeah. But he's fine. But like, if he were to go into one, like, what I'm thinking is like, could he fight at 170? Like, maybe he can. Again, I am not an athlete. I don't know how this works. Like, I'm not like. Yeah. I do like you just for fun. I'm not an athlete. I don't really know down this. Yeah, this is all for shits and giggles, of, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I know as much as a fan, but like, I'm wondering, like, could someone like Kamaru Usman or like, I don't know, like, Thiago Santos? Dudes are like big. Yeah, fans I don't Joel think Romero. Could, compete that could they fight at their like same weight class as they fight in the UFC? Like, I personally, again, my opinion doesn't mean shit, but like, I don't think. Khabib they could definitely could because not. no, I, Khabib's. I don't know how he makes one fifty five every time. Yeah, but yeah, I, it's that's my problem. Like you were saying, that have you? I've seen all those videos of the weight cuts, bro. Not only Khabib's. I've seen like the the girls one. I don't remember whose it was that she was cutting weight. Like Holly Holmes cut like weight cutting videos and. I've seen so many weight cutting videos of people like literally crying. There is a lot of controversy. They destroy their around, hormonal system, their endocrine yeah, system. Like it's there is a lot of controversy around the weight cuts. Yeah, especially in the UFC, like the weight cut system, and you know they should do what one does, in my opinion. But that will risk a lot of athletes, like not being able to fight yeah. anymore. Do you see Joel Romero now that he's going to belt or he's fighting at two hundred five? Yeah, I saw that. What the fuck? That's gonna be. Which like, that's yeah, it's gonna be weird. But it's gonna like, be fast, light, heavy. He weight. is forty years old. He's, he's forty fast. years old. Like that, it can't be good that you're losing over twenty five pounds. No, in like a week, like at it can't be good at any age. Yeah, it can't be good at twenty one. I can't imagine it being any good at forty years old. No, like, he's still in top shape at 40 which like is insane how yeah in good shape he's at 40 but like regardless of how good and like in how good shape you are like your body's still 40 like it can't be good that you're losing all that water weight so fast so like i yeah. think it's a very smart move that he finds at 205 i'm excited to see him because mostly because not only because he's gonna be fast but like because we're used to him being the biggest motherfucker in this vision Yes. He's not going to be that at 205. In no, fact, I think he's going to look small against some people. Yes, he is, yeah. He's going to look small. Like, fucking Anthony Rumble Johnson fights at 205 in Bellator. Yeah. And he's gigantic. No, he's, he's going to have to face some big dudes there. He's going to have to face some big so, dudes. And I'm interested to see. I think you'll see. be interested to see Yoel Romero being the smaller guy. Smaller, faster dude. That's I, I think that Which edge we've never will be... seen. Yeah, We've I've never, never seen him be seen smaller. No. Small dude. He's always been the biggest motherfucker in the division. I was looking at the predictions for this year, and uh, I was reading the CBS predictions for this year. And the first one they had is that Conor McGregor announces another retirement. And correct, I'm thinking he yeah. fights Dustin Poirier. And I think my prediction, my prediction is he beats Poirier. I think I think he beats Poirier. I think he will beat Poirier. You think it won't? No way. Conor McGregor won two fights last year. Both yes. of them, again, all dudes. Right. One at a bar and one at a rock. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think Conor McGregor, he's clearly a super skilled athlete. I 
take my hat off to like what he's done to the sport and like his prime he was amazing however he's just for what i've seen what everyone sees as much as he says as much as he trains and says he's strong mentally he doesn't have the mental strength and conviction of an active athlete who has like an actual goal and is willing to fight he doesn't to need death to anymore. for the title. Yeah. He doesn't need to, but again, right. that like weakens him mentally. Then Poirier has fought like so much in the last three years against bad dudes, against bad dudes. Like he's fought, he's fought who like, who he fought recently, like Khabib, he fought Dan Hooker, which like was again like there's been amazing fights this year. Hooker versus Poirier is my personal yeah, fight of the year. that's one of my personal that fight. Too. That's probably my favorite fight in the history. In history bad, of fighting, bad fight, man. Just like that's that fight was insane to me. Um, he's fought great fights. He's like showed us he can put up with five rounds. Of like non-stop, yep. like hitting and getting hit. That's the we thing. I think we haven't seen he... that in Conor McGregor in a long time. Who did better against that. Khabib? You think? Poirier. Yeah, I think so Poirier too. I think Poirier that, did a lot better. Poirier had the guillotine on him. It wasn't a very solid one, but he had yeah that control. Again, none of them had control against Khabib. But no, if I had <laughs> to choose one of them that had more control. It was definitely Poirier. Poirier. Yeah. Conor McGregor keeps tweeting. Two years later, he keeps tweeting about how he won that third round, which is highly debatable. <laughs> yes. But, and what he a keeps sad tweeting night, about man. that. And then you have Justin Poirier, who's like, like, he better than me. Now let's move on. Let's go beat some other fucking dude. And he did. Yeah, he, he went did. and beat a Just, bunch Justin of motherfuckers Poirier, on the way. Because he has such a strong conviction. He has such spirit, which is what makes him better. Better and better and better. And but I, I think don't know. that's why he's gonna lose. I think Conor McGregor is gonna go so this relaxed in it. I think what I think is gonna happen is if McGregor manages to like turn it on in the first two rounds, he he cuts he cuts him loose. He knocks him out. I if not hope, if not, it's gonna be in trouble. I kind of hope McGregor proves me wrong, but I really think. This fight is Poirier is just because, for what I've what I've seen in the last three years, Poirier showed so much skill, and we really haven't seen much skill at all from McGregor in the past three years. Yeah. So, I don't know. Based on recent fights, I think it's definitely Poirier's. McGregor may prove me wrong. Who knows? I kind of hope he does. Yeah. I think it's but gonna I be hope if he fight. does, he like goes and fights someone else. Like, just don't like tweet about you being the champion and then announce retirement three days later. Just he's gonna be like, yeah, I'm retiring. I'm the champion again. He's gonna be like, he's gonna be like, I won the title and then retires. Honestly, whoever gets this title now, it's honestly, I don't know. For me. In my opinion, the lightweight title is never going to be up for, up for grabs again. In my opinion. The lightweight title now is going to be something else. For at least the next five years, the lightweight champion is going to be something else. Because nobody in this division has been even close. There are close. three contenders. There are three, maybe four contenders to me for the obvious contenders. If Poirier wins, Poirier. Yeah. Justin Gaethje. Yes. And Charles Oliveira. Oh my God. Char Dude, Charles the Oliveira has wow. dominated that division in the shadows. No one seems to acknowledge him he's until now. He's schooled Ferguson. He's cool Ferguson, but he's been schooling dudes in that division. In the, rank, in the top 15 ranking, he's been schooling them. S like, scary dude. Seamlessly. Scary and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu dude, man. Scary. Wow. And he's a great striker too. Like, Yes. People have not been acknowledged until now, and like he's being silently coming for that title, and he's there. He's in the conversation. He made a fool out of Tony Ferguson, dude. He, he was, he was the like the most clear contender for the content contesting for the title. Yeah, he without made a, a doubt. Fool out of him, and 
I wish I would have seen I a fight think against Charles Khabib. Oliveira has the skill to beat McGregor. I think he has the yes. skill to beat Poirier. I think he even has the skill to beat Justin Gaethje. I think if McGregor wins whatever and they give him the title, which they shouldn't, uh, I think that Charles Oliveira would maul McGregor. And I would have wished to but, see a Charles Oliveira against against Khabib. I would have liked it, honestly. Me too. I think it would be in the fight that like would have been more evenly matched. Yeah. But if that's fine, like Dana White wants to like bring Khabib at all costs back and like that dude doesn't want to fight anymore. Just leave yeah. him alone. Yeah, he doesn't want to. It's fine. Respect. Anyways, his fights are not that interesting, so whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but I think Charles Oliveira, like I know UFC doesn't wanna do a title fight because they want to see what happens if McGregor wins. Right. Yeah, exactly. So they're going to wait for that. But if you ask me, he has to be Charles Oliveira. Charles Oliveira has to be the I next think... in line for to fight for the title against whoever you want to do it. If you want to do it against Justin Gaethje or if you want to do it against the winner of McGregor Poirier. Yes, that's I think fine. that's what I would do. I think I would do the winner of McGregor poor year. But then because... there is another dude who we're forgetting here. And who? that's Dan Hooker. Right. Dan Hooker is a bad dude. He's a really good martial artist. And he, yeah, he lost against Poirier, but it was like close fight. Really, really close fight. Yeah. And we're forgetting him in the conversation. And he really, like, he really he shouldn't be the next in line because he's coming off of a loss, but. He should be up there. Yeah, he should be one of the names. What about him against Gagey? Then Hooker versus Gagey. I think that makes sense. Yeah, I think that would be a cool fight to make. I think that would be a stylistically well matched up. Again, I don't know much about it, but I think me as a viewer, as a watcher, I would enjoy watching a, a dude who's gone five rounds against Dustin Poirier and came out the way he did against Justin Gagey, who's also known for a similar kind of fighting. So I, I don't know. I would like to see it. But Justin Gagey, you know, He's been known as this brawler. Uh, his last fight, I, I, I've it was a it was an interesting change. Well, in because him. it was against Khabib. I feel like Khabib is on a whole different tier. Like Khabib, as I, I don't particularly love him. Yeah, I don't hate him. Either. I just don't have strong opinions about him. But I of him as a person. But I yeah. think Khabib can still beat any of the people we've talked yeah, about in the past 10 minutes without still can do it but he's retired and he decides to stay retired i think the ufc should stop bothering him if you ask me or nobody i think yeah. the ufc should stop bothering him and just move on yeah and but i think right now the best dudes in the division in 155 are dustin poirier and charles Oliveira. i think they're the best two in the division I don't know, man. I really think I still I I'm maybe I'm having blind faith in McGregor, but I still feel like he has that. But do you know what? Part of me doesn't want him to win the fucking title because because then he's just gonna not fight like fight like once every two years. Yeah. And I think Conor McGregor as unless much as maybe I he's enjoy... changed. Maybe he's changed. The last fight he was nice. He was a I don't know. He acted like cool, humble, whatever. He didn't talk much. Well, he he acted humble because, like, how can you not be nice to Donald Cerrone? Yeah. Like, you... it's impossible not being nice to Cowboy. Like, yeah. if you act like a dick to Cowboy, like, then you're just a dick to everyone's eyes. Yeah, exactly. Because Cowboy is, like, the nicest dude around. Yeah. Like, like Cowboy and Wonder Boy Thompson are the two nicest dudes in the world. Like, they are. Like... If he, McGregor, McGregor, again, McGregor has good PR, obviously. Right. Mac, they knew, like, hey, don't be a dick to Cowboy. Like, he's a nice dude. Like, he's a really, really nice dude. And if you're a dick to him for no fucking reason, you're going to get backlash. It's honestly part of the reason why we started doing martial arts. Like, I don't know the reason. I mean... We're going to get into the reason why you like you started. I want to know exactly why you started too. But for me, it was like when my parents um, heard that there was a karate program in town when I was like five, I think, or six, they signed me up because it's like 
uh, personal defense. You know, they, my my parents signed me mm. up because why? Personal defense. And what did I learn? That I learned the ten rules. You know, like respect your opponent, respect everyone. Don't like go looking for fights. And you know, the at the basis of martial arts, there lays a lot of value and a lot of like good principles that have not only run fighters, but like the governing principles. Like nations have run on some of those principles. You know, in the past. So. I feel like there's a lot of martial arts that has been lost in this mainstream. And that's why I started like fighting. That's why when I learned how to fight, I was like, I want to defend myself against bullies. I want to defend myself against people that are going to fuck with me because they want to fuck with. I don't want anyone to fuck with me, but I'm not looking for a fight with anybody. I'm a nice person. I'm going to treat you nice. But if you want to fuck with me, you're not going to be able to. And if you want to hurt anybody that I know or my friend or my family, you're not going to be able to. So that was it for me. It was all like a noble thing. And I've always was taught to respect my opponent. You know, whenever I, I spar anybody or like I, I, it's hard for me to get amped up or like get adrenaline pumping because I don't like when I spar you, I don't, I'm not like hitting you. I'm like, dude, I got to be like serious because I got to make sure that I'm also competitive to the point where I got to make sure that I'm able to hit you. You know, like I'm not the kind of guy that's going to looking for a fight, but if it comes down to it, dude, like. I'm on, you know. So, what were your, what were, what was your, what were your goals when you were looking to 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 start fighting, to start training in martial arts, or just you know to learn a bit more about what the world is? Mine is much less deep. I started because I, I thought I wanted to know how to do boxing. I thought that. Um, yeah. Just because I want to know how to like fight, not that I hope that I ever need it, because I really yeah, don't. I don't hope that. Like I, I am not aggressive, like physically right. aggressive at least. And and I'll come back to that in a bit. But like, so I started because of that, and it seemed just like kind of like the obvious choice, like you know how to throw a few punches, whatever. Then I realized I don't like getting punched. I, I really, I mean, I don't think there's a person on that likes it, but like, I, I don't really don't like her. Like, I don't, I don't want to put up with it. Like, I, I don't, know. I don't. And guess what? I don't have to. Like, who's making me do this? Nobody's making me do this. I yeah, don't need nobody. to fight. I don't need to get punched for anything. I don't need to be punching people around. Like, I just don't like it. And immediately me being a non-aggressive person immediately makes me think like, I don't like getting punched. Like, that means that this person and practicing the sport with doesn't like getting punched either probably so yeah. like i don't have a desire to punch them yeah so like which make me makes me the least ideal candidate for this sport so i'm like you know what i don't want to yeah punch exactly or punch people i really don't so then i transitioned to jiu-jitsu which is like a grappling like a grappling martial arts there is no punching involved there's no kicking involved well there's some a little accidental kicking <laughs> it every yeah. now and then, but that's fine <laughs> and you know it's a lot of fun i still find myself in a few of the same predicaments where it's like at least my coach used to say a lot that i like i i lack aggression mm -hmm. like you need to be a little more aggressive you need to be a little more aggressive but then again i can't get myself to that point because i do not have a reason to be aggressive towards this person like you know what? In fact, I like this dude. Why would I want to be aggressive with him? I'm doing this for fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? I can't get hit. If he pulls me in a choke, I just tap. And that's it. He stops. Like, I can't do that with a punch. And like, I'm just here for fun. I'm glad to learn how to fight. But I just lack this aggression. Like, I just, I have no desire of hurting these people, you know? Right. Like, why would I do that? But I'm still here for fun. You know? How long How long have you been doing it for? It's been a, it's been a bit. I did it for a year and like two oh, months, yeah. one month. And then like everything stopped for Corona. And it would have been two years in January. But I guess just a year now. Damn. Yeah. Do you miss it? Yeah, I do. I really do. I heard there was a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gym that's open, that kept open, and they're having a, uh, I think it wasn't a restaurant, or was it a restaurant? I don't remember. There was a gym that got in trouble for staying open 
in New York? Probably. I mean, I know of a few places that are doing of course. classes like underground. Like I know a few people like being in this community means I know like people that train in other places and things like that. I would have access to it. I am being careful. Yeah. With the virus and the situation and all that. I That's sensitive, you know, that's good. I, I live with my girlfriend and she is very careful with it and I have to respect that. So therefore I'm being careful. So I wouldn't put myself in the position where I would like go, even though I miss it. And like my coach and my training partners are like sometimes like, hey, are you coming back? You're like, yo, what's help going on? Like I'm like, I would love to, but like I gotta be sensitive to others' needs and that's a really good de- like it's like a really that. smart so, decision yeah for now i go to the gym like on my own or like with one other person like you know lift weights and things like that things that are perfectly safe and you can keep your mask on for right um and i do that i do miss jiu-jitsu and i'm sure as soon as like the vaccine is out there for everyone and it's like safe to like you know roll with sweaty shirtless dudes around without a mask yeah i'll go back straight to it yeah and there'll be another learning curve because a year without it it's for sure forgot stuff right it's gonna take your body time to assimilate again but that's the beauty of learning again but that's just it and i miss it i don't have a rush to come back just because i prefer being safe in yeah. the situation no, that, that's a sensitive and sound decision, especially when you're living with somebody else and your decisions directly affect someone else. It is messed up. Like the situation is messed up, you know, but at the end of the day, like it's whatever you prioritize as being most important, you know, and in this situation, I, I think that you're taking like, you know, you're taking a sound decision like, hey, you're living with somebody else. And not only that, like also you and you see other people. So. Uh, I was just asking because, like, I know that some places are still open and they follow, like, procedures. Like, you can go in and they test, you know, every time they go in and they make sure that... Like, I don't know why they cannot do that. Why they cannot go to a place that you can just, you know, they have the quick test. Make sure everyone's good. If everyone's good, practice and then, you know, keep going. And if you're not good, then you cannot attend. And I I would do that, but apparently that cannot... That's too much. Yeah. It's... I mean... Everyone I know that's been doing like this underground things, I don't know of one of them has gotten sick, which is great. Yeah. And I'm sure they're all taking precautions and a lot of them are doing it because they're actually like either want or make a living yeah. off of martial arts. Yeah. Some of them are just doing it just because they want to and like, that's fine. I don't judge them for it. I judge if you like going to the grocery store and like walking around without your mask on, like yeah, just be a decent fucking human and do like the, the one bare not so hard <laughs> thing that you gotta yeah. do. But like, I don't judge people for like you know like people that are going to jujitsu, doing boxing, and things like that. Like, it's fine. I'm just doing what I know is right for me and my close people yeah for those who care that's the most but important it's, but it's fine it's like what's right for me now right. and what's right for them is this and it's it's great yeah totally, i just totally. don't want to put myself in that situation and i'll just i'll go back to it as soon as i can that's good but for now i guess i have no rush that's good it's it's nice that at least you can get this desire built up again you know because many times we also burn out at some point of doing something Especially yeah. when you don't train for like a competition or something. It's just you and self-progress. And this pause, I, I definitely see it like it's going to be something that I think you're going to come back hungrier, you know? And I remember when we did it, when we rolled last year and I rolled a grand total number of like uh, three times, four times in my life. Not a lot. And I'm and I'm waiting, you know, I am can't wait to, to start uh, yeah. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to win, you know, this whole shit, uh, comes down a little bit more but i'm happy to i'm happy that you know we, we our paths kind of crossed at a point where it was an interest for both of us like i remember when clark was like hey he, both of you like conor mcgregor both of you like fighting um talk and then we went and watched the fights and it was three title fights i remember like joanna uh, versus rose 
It was uh, Cody Garban versus um, Dillashaw. Dillashaw, and I don't remember the third title fight. But anyways, it was another one as well. And after that, I remember like I, at that point I was I was training uh, Muay Thai in Savannah Champions Training Center. Shout out! I had him. Actually, I had my coach on the podcast too. And you were like, "Hey!" And I told you like, "Hey, if you want, like, I can show you like the basics." Throw, and you're like, "Yeah, fuck yeah!" And then we started like going. And I just showed you, dude. I didn't know much either. I was also a beginner. I was like, "I'm taking what I'm learning from there and and applying it to him." You know, I was like, "I'm learning this. Mm -hmm. You do this." And you start hitting, and you know, we were just like messing around in front of the hive and. After that, I was happy that you started going and you found out that you didn't, in fact, want to, like, do boxing. I don't want to get punched. I, don't, I have no need to get punched. You know what? Like, yeah. And it was good. I don't I mean, need to get punched. Was our was our sparring the last time you sparred? Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't want to get punched. Like, I don't need to. I don't want to. And more importantly, I don't have to. Yeah. I don't There's have no to get punched. To, there's no reason to lose brain cells. <laughs> I'm perfectly fine with not getting punched. Like, if I ever have to fight for my life or in self-defense, well, okay, I'll do it, I guess, because I have to. Yeah. But, like, I don't need to, you know? I don't have to. My you don't day. have to, man. You can do some serious damage with jujitsu if needed. Take yeah. If you learn takedowns and jujitsu, you can hurt some people big time. Dude, listen, I wanted to ask you one last thing before we... Uh, kind of like closed off because I do want to talk to you about this because it's something that we kind of share in common and it's something that I think it's also interesting for people to learn about or not to learn but maybe to hear about uh, and, that, and that's the world of advertising um, I don't want to like I don't necessarily need to open a Pandora box but I, just to give some background I'm a junior copywriter I'm not really I, I, I'm not really anymore I'm, I'm, a, I'm a copywriter I'm a creative dude who's seeking uh, creative no, endeavors. No, but, it, but it, in commoner terms of like the advertising industry yeah. and like based on your experience, you yeah. would be a junior copywriter. I'm a junior so. copywriter and you are a uh, mid-level copywriter, right? Going yes. for senior. Um, I've explained countless of times what a copywriter does on this podcast, but it's somebody who basically writes about ads, writes marketing, writes all that. Like we know they're we part of We write Instagram agency. captions. That's what we do. When it comes down to the dirty things, especially as a junior, it's, it's those things like that. So, in an I can tell you agency, that I'm a story, I'm a brand storyteller. I write worlds, I write anything, but and I in a certain point I do that. But if you ask me what I do on my day to day, I'm gonna be honest with you. I write Instagram captions. That's what I do on my day to day. And guess what? I get paid for it, so it's fine. It, it's it's fair work you know it, it's it's good work it has to be done somebody has to write those captions so it is work um but yeah this is what it is in an advertising agency the text that is written virtually anywhere has to be and should usually be but not always is written by a copywriter and um it's a fucking roller coaster um i i've, I've worked i only i have brief experience i can say i had an internship of about, about three months and i worked as a freelance slash full-time slash something weird for another seven months um in chicago so i guess my, my question is for you is um what attracted you towards this advertising world and not what attracted you what got you what got you started with advertising and what is your current pulse on the situation on, um of advertising it's definitely a weird year for okay. ads and agencies so i want to hear your thoughts on that so to answer the first question what got me started pretty similar to the art martial arts question it's pretty anticlimactic um i was in college for film and then i realized i hate this <laughs> i don't want to switch colleges because it's a lot of work and i still want to graduate on time right so a friend of mine said you should take advertising so I did because I had plenty of electives because I didn't know what to do with my life. And I took it. And then the professor, Luke Sullivan, walked in into the first intro to advertising class and said, so you're all here because you like making money. <laughs> and then I just like, it just, I just kind of went along with it. I just kind of stayed there. <laughs> and then I started enjoying it, obviously, like at some point. Right. I really started enjoying it and like appreciating it and seeing 
that it takes much more than like people think when they see a commercial. Right. But yeah, I just kind of like I just kind of was there. I was just kind <laughs> in that class, and the professor said money, and I was like, I I can live with that. <laughs> oh my god, I think that this perfectly describes my girlfriend's path in advertising. She was just like, yeah, they told me you can make. They said this, and then I just kind of went along with it, and here I am. I graduated. I've done what they asked, and God knows where I would be if I had done film. Probably oh I started living with, film with my too? parents, dude. Tough time. Oh my god, dude. Sorry, I'm so sorry to just stop you, but between, do you remember when I said to you it was supposed to start snowing, and it's then snowing. I was like, but it's in, bro. There's two feet of snow already. Nice. Two feet, bro. Everything's covered in snow. Fucking Chicago, bro. Fucking Chicago. Anyways, yeah. Nice. Uh, what what were we on? I I completely. Got well, that's the story. anticlimactic story of how I started advertising. Yeah, you started advertising um, because you just barely you went along with it because I was I was just option. there. I was just there. It's kind of like I don't know if you. There's like this meme that like they said like Michael Sarah looks like a dude that started acting just because he kind of like walked by accident by a set and just kind of like. Yeah, they got they confused him with an actor, and he just went along with it until nowadays. That's kind of <laughs> yeah. like my story with advertising. I just kind of was there, and it just happened, and now I'm here. And somehow um, you ended up in a pharma ad agency. <laughs> and now I'm here, and I'm like, cool. Yeah, this is nice. But yeah, that's my anticlimactic story of how I got started. What um, about now? How? how but the now, now is very different. I am very much like I really enjoy advertising. I really, really like it. Like what I do and like what advertising does in general. Like even writing captions like for Facebook and Instagram. I think it's super dope that I get paid for it because I never really thought before of like writing captions for Instagram as a profitable thing. Um <laughs> Even that, like that, like the the little things, the bitch work, even I think that's kind of dope when you see it that way. I think the state of advertising is not just now, it's always for what I know, like even before my time, it's like being a very toxic environment. Yeah. As many things are, like I'm not saying this is like exclusive things for advertising, like I have friends who work at like video game development and see me sell things, tell me the same things, friends that work in films and film and television and tell me the same things friends that work in marketing and tell me the same thing but what i can speak to is advertising or i can speak to based on first-hand experience it's advertising and it is a very toxic place it's obviously gotten much better than in the 80s when they had a miscellaneous budget which was all for cocaine this is a true <laughs> story that a creative director told me once damn um when For they went real? in shoots, when they went in shoots, there was a but a part of the budget that said miscellaneous, and that was cocaine. Um, when was that? Like the eighties. Holy shit! Yeah. What a good time to be an. So I do think For it's people. gotten much better in that way, where you know women weren't allowed to be great directors, for example. Yeah. No. Um. All jokes aside, you know. Yeah. But it's still a very toxic place. There is. A lot of people with very big egos, which like, yeah, man, they've done some really nice commercials, like some really famous commercials. But when you say it out loud, it's like, oh, this person is an egomaniac, self-proclaimed genius because he wrote that one Nike commercial. It sounds kind of dumb, doesn't it? Like, so you're egotastic fuck because you wrote a commercial is yep. that why you're being so it's the so one good thing he's done and he bad. can identify like, with even if you wrote the 500 good commercials you're being an egomaniac that's a dick to people yeah because you write commercials when you say it out loud it sounds a little stupid like if you tell me like Oh, I wrote Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Then I'll be like, you're still a dig, but like, damn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you wrote commercials, you know? Like, I I don't take my work my work lightly. I'm not I, I I put my all into my work, whether I like 
what I'm doing at the moment or not. I put all yeah. my all into it and I, I don't take it lightly. But at the end of the day, I know no one's going to die if this banner ad doesn't come out on Wednesday, but it comes out on Thursday. Exactly. You know, like, it's just advertising and people seem to forget sometimes. And like, you could have a little bit of an ego because you did a good work. It's fine. It's happened to a lot of people. It happened to me in one of my internships. I did something really good and I had a little bit of an ego. Like, that, I mean, that's just human behavior. But if there's a lot of people just because they've done like good commercials, I repeat, they've done yeah. good commercials. I want you to say it out loud. <laughs> it's and commercials, it. dude. It's commercials. Like, that's <laughs> what you did. Like, yeah. If you're going to be like, if you're going to have such a big ego and like be a dick to people and like just act all like high and mighty because of that, like, that just like to me just rules you out of people that would want to have my agency yeah you know because like it is a very toxic place people that like act like that and like therefore manipulate you and yeah dude then they make it seem like it's it's the fucking end of the world and i've i cannot I say have, that i've experienced I've had a few, it i've had a few internships before. Yeah, I was this gonna is not say a story of my current workplace. Again, I work in farm advertising. The pace is a little different than regular advertising, but I had a few right. experiences, work experiences in like regular consumer advertising agencies. And yeah, tell me about it. And I've had just like really, really bad experiences with like creative directors and higher ups that like I was working under, and they were just like very manipulative and mean in general like Maybe they make you feel like you're not good for this and they make you feel like everything is your fault and like you believe them because like i mean i'm young and like i was even younger back then and i like obviously look up to the people that wrote cool commercials right and i still do but i gotta know the person because if you're a dick and other things, like it's just not worth looking up to you because at the end of the day, you're just a mean fucker that writes commercials. What is some of the stuff that has happened? You don't have to be like say names or specify things, but like if you don't want, like if you don't mind, like what are some of the ways that you've experienced this toxicity? You know, because I, I can tell you, like just to open up first, like. In, in my way, it wasn't, I had no problem with the creative team and where I was working at, um, creative team was done. It was always the administration, the communication, uh, and the, the, they say one thing and they do the other thing when it comes to like, uh, diversity yeah. and immigration. But that's just, that's just bureaucracy, not right. necessarily from the people that are telling it to you, but like from the holding company. So yeah. It's like to that point, like there is obviously nothing you can do, but also there is nothing that the HR person or the administrator of the stock is you can do. Because exactly. They're really just following a protocol that yeah. is given to them and like their jobs depends on keeping that protocol. Yeah. But as far as like creative interactions, like yeah. I I I don't really want to get into the specifics, but like in general, like the person was very manipulating, making me feel bad, like about my work and things like that right like, we'll straight up things like we'll read the first option and like say i'm not impressed and walked out of the room and like things like that's like there is no reason for you to be acting like this and yeah. then this and then i've also experienced not firsthand but i was there like like a lot of like sexual harassment to my friends to people i know to people that i work with to like people that yeah. i'm close with like like a lot of like actual sexual harassment by higher ups, like interns, yeah. just because they can. And like these interns also look up to them because you know they made that cool commercial, yeah. And like they can, you know, if if I like if they like me, they can put me in touch with people and they can like ensure a, a spot on for me on the agency. And I've yeah. seen a lot of I've seen a lot of sexual harassment, and this was when I was an intern and like bad for me and i didn't say anything and that's really bad of me not saying anything now i know better and like if i see it i say it right but like back then i was like just thinking for myself and like thinking of me having a spot in this 
in this world and things like that in this world of advertising and like but just the fact that i think back to it and i s know how i saw this like blatant sexual harassment is just terrible like right and it was also your first it. time in the you said it was you're an intern so it was one of your first times that you yeah. had to deal with something like that and it's like what the fuck are you supposed to do you, you you never told this in ad school you know like what do you do if you see this shit happening and you're yeah. like what do i Which care what, what, what's gonna happen to my career as well and you know? a lot of things in ad school like they obviously like tell you the good and like the good and the pretty of advertising which is like, yeah fine you're not gonna walk in and say like this industry is filled with rapists like you're not gonna <laughs> yeah. go in and say that although i think it could help if it people should. said that but also like ad school just gives you like a whole like a very different perspective like at least my experience with ad school was very like i had a blast but also they i left with the i left ad school with the feeling that if I didn't work in one of the top name agencies and wrote for like Nike or a like on like the top brands, I was gonna be a nobody. I left with the impression that I had to like breathe, like eat, bleed fucking advertising and nothing else, and you're nothing but a yeah, like a, like a commercial making machine. I yeah. left with that impression, which like led me to a lot of personal issues in the past where I'm like. I am not in the top agencies. I'm not, I'm not doing this amazing work and things like that. So like, I'm no one and like, I'm nothing but my work. And like, luckily through like a lot of like exploring, like who I am, the hobbies I like to do, I found that there is actually a line there. It exists. Like you can still put your all into your work, but like enjoy other things in life. Not exactly. let your character your persona be defined by like advertising if you want to do that that's fine there's people that do that because like advertising is their only hope, hope and their only life. identity the only thing they can identify with because they have fine. nothing else going for them you know and that's but okay that's fine like if you want to do that that's fine yeah there's but nothing wrong the thing that i want to say to like people in high school and i actually did when i went back and taught to like yeah. i went back to college like as an employee of advertising to talk i did say like if you want to do that that's fine but know that you shouldn't feel obligated to make this the only thing in life this no one's making you have advertising and your career in advertising be your only defining trade yeah and you are an extension of your hobbies of what you do like i i enjoy i i paint i illustrate a lot i enjoy doing that i love that i like i like comedy i enjoy comedy so much and like that's another big part of who i am i like watching mma and that's another big part of who i am i like playing video games and like understanding like video games and his history and things like that and right like, that's another trait of who i am and then there is another trait of who I am who's like, I am interested in advertising and I yeah. work in advertising and I put my all into my work, but I don't yeah. let it consume my life. Because at the end of the day, like if it's your life and you're happy with your work and if that's your life, that's fine. But if you let advertising and work be the only thing in your life, the only thing that defines your life and you're not happy at the place you're working in, you're going to be fucking miserable. Yeah, you're going to be Because destroyed. you don't have any other outlet in life. And you're going to feel more so, you're going to feel like a failure because all you were thought was like, you are an extension to your company. So like, you're going to be miserable and it's going to lead to some like problems, you know? And yeah. Just what I'm saying is like, be do the things you like like still put effort in your work especially in your Always. early years because you need to but don't let it be the only thing in your life if there's something else you want to do that's super important and i think that's one of the biggest lessons that i've learned from you this year you know and um there's many times that i've felt wrong to take a break from work and 
that also stems from the from an ego because like i said i I can tell you why these people have that because i had that too when i went on my internship uh last year in chicago i was by myself it was my first internship i got hired on my first try and it was easy it wasn't maybe like the highest name the ranking agency whatever but it was like i'm an international kid and i got liked by this agency and they make it seem like they love you and i was aware you know like i was always like hey remember like you know, be careful. Like it's not as it seems, but you're still the first time that you enter this world, and it's hard and to just like not get lost in it. And I was tired working like a bitch. I was ranking like the most hours out of everybody in there. I was waking up. I was getting there early. I was going to the gym. I was like running on caffeine. I was like working out. I was hanging out every single night, barely sleeping. I didn't need sleep. Doing everything I did. I fought. We had an exhibition fight. We did Taste of Chicago. I did Lollapalooza. I did everything that he, I couldn't stop. I was a fucking machine. But and I reached at the end of the summer and I was like, bro, how the fuck am I going to do this for 20 a part something of me, years? A part of me wants to say, like, I don't know if you have any listeners that like go to ad school or like are still like students. Yeah, yeah. there's a there's but, a couple or th- a few. But part of me to what you said says like, do that because that's what being an intern means like, you should and especially you should. if you go to another city because like there's so much you want to do like and I but love then again it. you're doing other things you're yes. doing other things enjoying your city enjoying hanging out with people your age are also interning yeah. and also going through the same thing yeah and do that but also know that being an intern is very different to what you're gonna so encounter different. in real life like i wish i could be an intern all my life man <laughs> yeah that'd be great but like you'd be like eating canned tuna every night basically but yeah. um and yeah like it's much different and like i enjoy my internship so much like so much especially my first internship like i my first internship in advertising was the best summer of my life by far it's incredible by far. yeah and and I was the same as like you then, like I was working so much. I was like giving my all, but also like I was hanging out with the other interns. I was hanging out with my other friends. I was hanging out with my neighbors. I was working out every day. I was like doing everything, everything, everything yeah. possible, exploring Chicago, exploring whatever. But do know that that's fine. But internship life is an experience that doesn't last very long and it's not gonna be the same it's not a realistic approach to the real like the real yeah i was happy that i burnt it like i i i took everything i could from that including you know a job that i later had through a pandemic you know at the end of the day i can stay here and shit talk about all this and that but uh, i was lucky enough that that led to a an opportunity where you know most of the people couldn't get a job and I was uh, I was happy and I was lucky enough to have a job that not only a job a job that I enjoyed doing Mm -hmm. so like I like you said do that because that is going to be what's going to get you the job but don't expect it to be the same I didn't know you know and it's just like you know when you go to summer camp before going to college Mm -hmm. it's the same you kind of do like you kind of know what the school is like but it's not the same thing as an intern I saw what life was and I expected it to be different but not that different it's like in intern you're like oh this is learning mode like everyone like i had this barrier where oh i know that everyone knows that i'm allowed to do errors i'm allowed to have mistakes when i was a junior i felt like that wall of making mistakes was suddenly shattered and you're like now expected to do shit like and do it well you know because you got hired you're not an intern Mm -hmm. and so I was like, shit, wow, this is def- this definitely feels different. This is not as glamorous. And you know, okay, different scenario. We went from we went into a world where we started working from home and all that. And I guess a lot of what work was for me, what I enjoyed about work was the social aspect, like seeing other people, talking to other people was huge for me, you know? And I realized this made me help help me realize that maybe I don't like this particular job as my job that's gonna be there all my life, you know. I do want to continue like trying at it, but like you said, the difference between an internship and the job was like you get your hands in the 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 raw and the dirty and the actual stuff that you gotta do and the heavy lifting, and it's not only ideation, it's 
execution and you see how some ideas go to die and and it's sad it's honestly sad but it's the real and fucking another deal. thing another thing is like the more time you spend advertising as a full-time employee right and the more and more time you start to realize that like more and more like people like stop hanging out after work and things like that because i mean the like the more you stay like obviously like people get older and things like that but like you realize like people have other lives outside of work that they put yeah. more and more priority into than like hanging out with work colleagues and yeah. like it's true like i rarely hang out after work with like work people like back when we were in office and all that yeah i rarely did i did every now and then like i have one like i have like one or two really really good friends that i talk to like a lot from that i got from my job and like still like i see them sometimes and all that but like it's not like when you were an intern where you're like oh every friday after work we're gonna go yeah get drunk and then on saturday we're gonna see each other too yeah you know it's exactly. like it's it, the more you stay in advertising the more you realize it's not like that at least in most places yeah i i think it's true i think it's true i saw i used to see everybody get up at 4 4 30 you know and you can see by the how old they are they, this is when they leave you know the oldest and the highest ranking you sometimes see them the less you go down you're like oh they leave at 4 30 some leave at three some leave after lunch some people never show up you know <laughs> it's like that i agree and i agree that people make it all about their life and i've learned this 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 year and i've learned a bit more i cannot say that i've achieved enlightenment but i've learned that hey dude it's okay to sometimes take a take a break and take a breath from from advertising and from your work especially from such work like advertising you're not a doctor you know because sometimes doctors cannot just decide to take a break in the middle of an operation you know but yeah. in advertising and as a copywriter either you're writing words you can or you're designing pictures pretty pictures and so, like again i'm not saying i'm not saying that like there isn't gonna be urgency every now and then like there's something that's the worst needs to get yeah. done you need to stay yeah. late and that's that's fine but that's there is that in every job right you exactly. know and but it doesn't need to be a recurrent thing it where like not, people yeah. are overworked for no tangible reason. Yeah. I agree. I totally agree. Well, dude, honestly, I think this is a good point to leave it because uh, I, I feel like we've covered so many different topics in such, such depth that yeah, you're going to need to make three separate episodes. Nah, dude, <laughs> I look, I'm going to finish it with this. The amount of, advice that i'm receiving from everybody on this podcast and how i can improve it is insane and i'm and i'm and i love it because i i, I know people uh, listen to it and and i'm and i'm craving for feedback from from people but uh i always listen to the considerations i've listened to like people that said hey some of the episodes are long i've started doing a lot of clips so i'm gonna divide this one into like many many clips mm -hmm. and title them so people don't have to listen to fucking three hours or i don't know two hours that we've been talking so Another thing that I've been doing is like that I'm I love making these long. I love having this as a conversation. I don't have a particular subject. I swear there's a there's fuck in the title. Uh I have a, an episode in Spanish, you know, because this podcast is not gonna be only in English. Like this up podcast episode started in Spanglish. Like there is no structure, and what I'm trying to push out there is that uh authentic content can be achieved and should be achieved by everyone you know and we're talking about advertising mm -hmm. and we're talking about this and all that i feel like this kind of stuff is a, a lot more valuable than sitting down and having a scripted <clears throat> uh censored thing yeah. where we're going to be careful not to offend anybody we're going to be careful not to you know we're always going to be sensitive and respectful but we're not going to be able we're not going to have a, a, an agenda i have no agenda other than uh spreading love and making sure that everybody can for at least a few minutes, forget about what they're doing and listen to two bros talking, you know? We're Absolutely. no experts. We're not professors. We're not MMA, uh, uh, you know, connoisseurs or anything. In fact, I'm not good at anything. <laughs> We're just a bunch of bros talking and, and you are good. You're good at being a friend <laughs> because you've given me so much advice this year that uh, has proven to 
appreciate it. me a lot. So that I really doesn't pay me. the bills, but I appreciate it. it you know <laughs> what? You know what? It will come back to you in some way or another. I promise. <laughs> thank you. Dude, thank you so much for, for joining me. This is the last episode of 2020, the fucking year. Uh, thank you for joining me, man. And live from Chicago, this is whatever the fuck this is with Vlad. Oh, shit. Thank you, dude. Thank you so much. All right. Peace. All right, man. See ya. See ya. See ya.